It's going to be really dry and boring. <laughs> you know, every year, our great law school, among many other distinctions, is consistently recognized as one of the very top entertainment law schools in the country. In fact, if you don't have a Brooklyn Law graduate working for you, you're not a D-lister, you know? Now, come on, you know what that means. All right, that wasn't that bad. Now, we're, we are really proud to have with us tonight somebody that demonstrates beyond doubt that we deserve that reputation. And we're so proud to have Marty Singer, class of 77, with us. I mean, many of you know that my own son, who did stand-up comedy, cruelly said that I can embellish a little bit and that I put the BS and BLS. Um, but when I say to you that we're a top entertainment um, law school, uh, you only have to look to one person to remove any doubt that that is the case, and that is uh, our graduate, Marty Singer, who is uh, one of the, without doubt, best entertainment, go-to lawyers, entertainment business litigators, uh, in the United States, and since we do that best, I might as well say the galaxy, because, you know, why limit ourselves? Now, just to begin, I'll have a few more words to begin, is that we have um, a short tape, short recording of messages from some of Marty's friends. And so, if this works, let's play this tape for about a few minutes. First time I met Marty was at a prior firm that I worked with, Schiff, Hirsch, and Schreiber. Marty came in. He had moved out from the East Coast with his young wife, Dina Singer, and he was uh, establishing a home here. And he came in as a kind of a trial probation lawyer uh, from working with the firm. And that's how I really got to know him as a entry level guy. We started Laveley and Singer going on 32 years ago on Independence Day in uh, July 1980. And that's when we opened our doors and made a totally irrational, crazy decision, thinking we could take on the world without any clients, figuring we would not be subject to all those vicissitudes of other big firms, and we would do it ourselves. So we worked hard and it was the two of us and one secretary and then uh, every now and then we'd hire an associate and slowly we grew over the years. I don't want to give my age away because I know that I look like I'm in my 30s but I've known Marty for almost 30 years. He's not just a great lawyer but he's a great human being, my friend and one of the best friends I have. Hi, I'm Sylvester Sloan. Uh, obviously I'm doing time in Folsom Prison. <clears throat> but they allowed me out in the yard 15 minutes a day, so I'll dedicate a minute to you, Marty. Because I heard is that the Beverly Hills Bar Association made you Entertainment Lawyer of the Year. It's about time. I got so excited the day that I met Marty because he'd been this voice on the phone to me for a really long time. And I think I expected to meet this old, gray-haired, this kind of heavy, duty guy and I looked up and this guy said to me I'm Marty Singer and he was this young handsome <laughs> regular looking guy so Marty congratulations of uh, being the entertainment lawyer of the year I can't imagine anyone else having this but you and just so you know it has been over 30 years I love you to death and um, I know you'll always be there for me, and I want to be there for you for this very, very special evening. Marty Singer would be the first, the second, and the third call I'd make if I had a civil, criminal, personal, or financial matter I needed advice on. There's nobody better. Marty's like the Super Bowl of lawyers. He's like the winning Super Bowl team all rolled into one guy. Every bad thing that anybody could say about any lawyer uh, Marty destroys. The law can let you down and then you believe again because of someone like Marty. When you have a problem, 
don't call your doctor. You don't call your uncle or your aunt or someone else. Yeah, call Marty Singer. It's a problem. You call Marty. Let's get Marty. He's your guy. Marty's nickname in the media is Bulldog. So I think it's apropos. It's Times Magazine, I think, named him Mad Dog. He's Mad Dog Singer. Marty's like when Tyson bit the ear off that guy. That's like Marty in, in law. And if somebody was getting ready for Marty the Bulldog, that you know was in the form of a tornado or a hurricane, Marty would hit him with a volcano or a tidal wave. Marty's like, <laughs> that's Marty Singer. He's bringing the Bulldogs. I named them all Marty. Come on, let's go. Come on, Marty. Come on, Marty. Marty, Marty, Marty. Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? that was tremendous. Really uh, amazing. And uh, now uh, you've heard a lot from his friends. Vanity Fair recently described Marty Singer as a throwback, a uh, scrappy, working class, self made son of European Jewish immigrants who studied nights at the City College of New York and at Brooklyn Law School rather than go to fancier places so that he could support his family while he was doing his studies. Um, and his newly widowed mother, who was a survivor of Auschwitz, and also his little sister. These roots served him very, very well. Shortly after graduation uh, here, as I said, in 1977, he decamped to Los Angeles and founded uh, Lavely and Singer in 1980. His practice grew very quickly and has not stopped growing and thriving. His firm has been a world premier in a entertainment litigation firm. He's representing the A-list celebrities uh, that you just saw and many others against tabloids and other media and in turn uh, internet outlets and also a broad range of the entertainment industry disputes uh, involved his work. He's also um, working on a sizable number of Fortune 500 and Forbes 400 clients and their matters. Among his partners, Andrew Brettler, a member of the Brooklyn Law School class of 2005, thank you very much for continuing to hire. Uh, and Marty has described uh, by, been described by others as the bane of studio chiefs and tabloid editors, and uh, as a rabid defender of stars in trouble. His clients praise him, they keep coming back to him, as you heard, because of his unfettered loyalty, but also because of his effectiveness. Scarlett Johansson, wait a minute, I have to pause for a minute. Scarlett Johansson? <laughs> has called him a real-life superhero. You heard Sharon Stone call uh, note uh, that he's like the guy Mike Tyson biting off uh, Alexander, uh, biting off Hall Hollyfield's uh, ear in the fight. Uh, the Academy Award-winning director of The French Connection, William Friedkin, commented, commented that there are two words that strike fear in the hearts of every, uh, every network uh, head or studio chief, and those two words are Marty Singer. The list of Marty's high-profile clients reads like the front row at the Academy Awards, including Leonardo DiCaprio, Jennifer Lawrence, Tom Hanks, Harrison Ford, Sylvester Stallone, Bruce Willis, George Clooney, Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, Sofia Vergara, and Martin Sorcese, among others. Sorcese, among others. Marty credits his hard-nosed origins for giving him a great competitive advantage over what he says are sun-softened locals. <laughs> He's received numerous accolades and awards for his work, and uh, these include the 1912, uh, 2012, not 1912. <laughs> He's been going a long time. He's been successful so long, but you know, not quite that long. Uh, Entertainment Lawyer of the Year in 2012 by the Beverly Hills Bar Association. He's held the Chambers USA prestigious leading individual ranking for media and entertainment litigation lawyers every year consecutively from 2016 back to 2008. I think they should just retire the award, Marty, or give you a Lifetime Achievement Award. He's also been named to the Daily Journal's list of the top 100 lawyers in California every year consecutively from 2016 back to 2005, and the Hollywood Reporter's list of the top 100 power lawyers. Marty has also been profiled in several magazines and newspapers, including Vanity Fair, The New York Times, the Hollywood Reporter, Los Angeles Magazine, and LA Con Confidential. Um, so I'd just like to begin um, 
uh, with a story, uh, uh, with a conversation with Marty about his journey from Brooklyn to Los Angeles, and basically um, ask you, Marty, uh, to talk a little bit about you know your early life and how you prepared you for the successful career that you're in right now. Well, it's interesting. When I started college, I had no desire. I, I didn't have any desire to even be a lawyer, and. Uh, for unforeseen circumstances, I switched. I was an engineering student. I wanted to be a doctor. Well, I was great in math and science, but I could never stand the side of blood, or more importantly, to deal with people who are dealing with their losses as a doctor. So uh, I had a switch, and at, law, at CCNY, they were very nice to me, and they said, well, why don't you try political science? I said, what's political science? Is that the study of politics? I said, no, think of social studies, and ultimately um, the difference is to go to class 35 hours a week, and I can go 12 hours a week to get 16 credits. But that led me on the career ultimately, and you could either be, go to law school or be a teacher. I said, I want to be a sports casual. Well, you don't even need to go to school, so, um, <laughs> for that. But ultimately, uh, I was fortunate. I, I did get into some other better schools, but I had to stay in New York. Uh, and I was on the waiting list for NYU, and I've, all my kids have wanted to go to NYU. I said, it wasn't good for me, good enough for me. Forty years ago, it's not good enough for you. <laughs> so, uh, although I think NYU is, uh, in any event, I was fortunate enough to get into Brooklyn Law School, and it was uh, a whole different environment. I, I heard that Dean Allen teaches a, a class just before you start law school now, which is like something to prepare you for. Like we just went from college as some of the other older graduates know, or the whatever graduates know, into right away getting into law. And we were talking outside how we had one professor. There was an old movie, most, most people don't know about it, called Paper Chase, uh, where they had a professor, House, I uh, forgot his name, but we had one constitutional law professor. John Houseman. John Houseman. But the professor's name I won't mention because he ruined the lives of many people who <laughs> want to be lawyer. Uh, but it, you know, the, the great things, in my opinion, about Brooklyn Law School, when I, especially when I moved to California after I graduated, is they really teach you pragmatically how to deal with issues, and they had great professors to deal with real life, and so you would be able to handle uh, real life matters, not just, you know, looking at a case book, and yes, it's true, you can figure out who's right and who's wrong, what's the reason for that. It literally taught me how to reason. And so it was a great introduction, and I and I clear, clearly had, I've continued to use that analysis throughout my whole career, through the last 40 years practicing as a lawyer. So why leave New York and why Los Angeles, and then why entertainment law and business? Well, well first of all, as I said, I had no desire to have anything to do with entertainment, but my wife's here. So in terms of why did I move to L.A.? Well, first of all, this is the issue. We had made the decision. Total different lifestyle in 1977. I don't know if people remember Son of Sam. Uh, I know my wife was so afraid. We lived in Queens. They were going after brunettes and uh, getting out of the subway. And it was. And what really turned me on to California was in January. It's like when you used to go and you seen January where you got the snow and the cold, and we had a horrible crime rate. I always said, and I went to California. At first, I went here and in 75, but then I came for a week of interviews, couldn't get a job. Nobody even knew what Brooklyn Law School was. They thought, you still in college, Brooklyn College? I said, no, Brooklyn Law School. <laughs> and, uh, and the comparison then, I hate to say, I would say like crime in New York would have been about a nine, and LA at that time, I think it's reversed since then, uh, was about a two, and it was clean, and it was beautiful in January. And my wife knew her family. She had some family then. Ultimately, they wanted to move out here. So we made the decision to move out to California. But uh, I don't know if we have my old transcripts, but I was great because of math and science. I thought I wanted to be a tax lawyer. The last thing I thought, and, and I had no desire to have anything to do with entertainment. I just fell into it, literally, uh, when I applied to a local news, a newspaper in Los Angeles. I don't know if they have one. I think they had one in similar in um, New York and LA, it's called the Daily Journal, and they just have ads. And you fill out an ad with a blank P.O. box number, and I applied, and I still have the letter that was written exactly about 40 years ago. You're interested in working part-time as a law clerk with no 
capitalized on like possibly a full-time work as a lawyer, give us a call. Mm. I said, fine, I was waiting for bar results. And I didn't even know uh, it, they did entertainment law. And I, shortly after I worked there, I got the impression, it was it, at the time, I didn't even know, but it was a boutique entertainment firm, but they had litigators and they had a tax, tax department. And there were two criteria if you wanted to get hired for that firm. First, the easy part, well, you've an Ivy League law school degree. Number two, well, you went to USC. Uh, why USC? Because they have a great marching band? No. Uh, because one of the senior partners uh, went to USC, and they have a great alumni uh, program throughout the, one of their features. They have, like, rather go to USC than UCLA. And uh, so I, I didn't have any expectations. I wasn't looking for a job, per se. I just wanted to do my work. And uh, after I passed the bar, they said, you know, they really like your work. They never had anyone work like me, I guess. I don't know. As I said on some other interview, I said it was a big difference I had competing with California lawyers in that coming from Brooklyn and from my background, I was a very hardworking person, and I was very diligent. While most of the lawyers there at 5 o'clock, they were ready to go surfing. So um, <laughs> it was a, and it was a whole different mentality. The mentality was, eh, we'll get to it tomorrow. No big deal, and I wanted to make sure the project was finished at the time, and I'm the first person they hired. Unfortunately, it lasted for three years because then the firm dissolved. Maybe because of me, I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, two partners don't get along, and then that happens. But basically, um, and I still remember to this day, I was making $18,000 a year as a lawyer. Some of my, my cousin went to Harvard, was making close to 40. I didn't mind. My wife was a legal secretary making 24000 a year. I was happy. And I didn't think of myself in anything with entertainment. In fact, my first big case was an uh, antitrust case. So you'd have no idea, you know. But ultimately, and I think of myself as a litigator that re starts representing. So that firm lasted for about three years. Uh, and then the firm uh, dissolved. My wife was pregnant uh, with our second child. My first child was 14 months old. And I saw a piece of paper on April 1st on my desk that said, the firm is going out of business or dissolving in 30 days. So I don't know if they still honor that day now, but back in 1978, that was called April Fool's Day. So I said, is this a joke? No. You've got to find a job. And uh, it was interesting in that I was very busy. I think I had a case that was about to go to trial, and I was working two weeks, and my wife said, you know, you've got to find a job. And ultimately, I made a decision. You saw Jay Lavely. He came to me one day, and he said, you know what? I never want to be in a position where someone tells us you're out of work and you're out of a job. And I had a lot of job offers, but because I had ran a silkscreen printing business through college to help support my mother, brother, and sister, I was entrepreneurial. And we didn't know what kind of practice we were going to develop. I mean, we knew we had come from a firm, and then ultimately lawyers began referring business to us, and we began to having a niche where we became known and we had some very interesting cases along the way and we started to develop a reputation. In fact, my first, the first big case we handled in the entertainment industry was in approximately 1982, when I say big case, it was a case that made tremendous news. I don't know if people know about Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor was a comedian, he was a big comedian back then. Now, you know, anyway, but, and he was perhaps the top, one of the top comedians. And people may not remember, but one day, he burned himself, yeah. he put himself on fire and tried to kill himself. And it was a horrible situation, and he trusted his, he trusted his, quote, personal manager, was a lawyer from Atlanta, and he was so good to this person, he not only paid him a lot of money every year, entertainment lawyers get paid a percentage, we get paid on the hourly, for two years in a row, one year he gave him a Rolls Royce, and the next year I think he gave him like a Corvette convertible, whatever the top convertible was, just as an extra gift. And what does he find out the day before he tries to kill himself? His, his lawyer had stolen literally a few million dollars from him. And the question was, what do we do? And so my partner and I, he was the lead counsel, found an, a law in New York called the Labor Commission statute. And it was very rarely used. And even though he was a lawyer who was licensed to practice in Atlanta, it was literally one of the first times ever that a California administrative judge found that because he was not a licensed talent agent, he was negotiating deals, 
his agreement was void, and we got literally an award of about $3 million. This was 1982. And it was huge news throughout the entertainment community that, first of all, Richard Pryor was a big star, and uh, I don't know if people really knew that much about that's why he tried to kill himself. But from that case, and then actually as cases develop, and since then, you know, we do all different types of law, but I've had big cases against some famous celebrities, and then after I get a great result, now all of a sudden they become a client, which is the, the biggest compliment. I'll never forget a huge case where the lawyer on the other side didn't understand the law, where somebody did a little book, and it was a photo book from Arnold Schwarzenegger, and my client was the photographer. He was willing to take $2,500, you know, pay me for the photo, and Arnold Schwarzenegger's lawyer took the position at the time, no, it's a picture of him. You don't own any rights. I said, well, there's something called the Copyright Act. Um, and we got a great result, a big result. There was another case against someone else. I had a case where Roseanne was against me, when she was the biggest person in television. And then subse subsequently, she became a client. So um, in any event, so things evolved that we had no, I had never any intention to get into this field. It's grown. And as they say, that's Hollywood. So you, you. <laughs> You worked hard, you were fearless, you got good results, you were creative, and you kind of figured it out as you went along. I mean, and your clients grew from, from the results. That's fantastic. Right, well, here's an interesting thing. When you, we get a lot of business from lawyers, and I don't know if other people who are practicing lawyers now get them from lawyers, but you know, it's a very difficult task because what you need to do, you gotta get a, hopefully a great result for the client and also get a good result so that the lawyer doesn't look bad because once you lose a case, or get them, that's the end of that referral source. Now, over the years, I've been known as someone who, in fact, a lot of clients have said, I, I don't want to take a call from Marty Singer, my own client, because I know it's bad news. And, the, and they're serious because, I mean, there's some bad news. It's either they did something bad, could be like something involving, we've had settlements of cases over the years that people are panicking now what's, whether these cases are going to come out. You know, that now people feel that they can disclose, even though they may have had a confidential settlement over the years. Someone gets caught doing something they shouldn't be doing. Um, or someone didn't honor their contract. I've had people, the transactional lawyers and the agents and managers will call me up and say, by the way, you know, the, my client got an offer to play Superman on this role. Now the studio pulled the offer. I said, okay. So I'm sorry to hear that. I said, do we have a case? No. So why are you calling me? Well, you always tell bad news to the client, so can you call on my behalf? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, fine. Mark, Mark, let me ask you this. So you, you have, by virtue of your reputation and results, you have people referred to you. Um, can you tell us the extent you can talk about it? Any uh, be clients that you decided not to take, or if not by name, then generically, how do you make that kind of decision? Well, last week was Harvey Weinstein. I turned him down, but that's a different story. Um, well, you know, it's interesting after you're practicing for 40 years, you know, who do you turn down? And it's hard to know. I've learned, and maybe it's my belief, if someone does something really bad, they're going to do something bad to their lawyer. They don't have, and that they're not going to pay fees. They may bring a claim. So I really want the young law students, and there's some, you know, a lot of people, that's been my experience. Hard, and I've been asked to represent people who've had bad reputations, and if, I feel that they have that type of reputation. Uh, I'm going to pay. But people really don't know that. Like for example, Steven Seagal, you sh they showed up here. Steven Seagal had it sometimes a bad reputation, but I got to know him, and in my opinion, he was a good guy. And so you develop that. But you know, here, here's an example. I was in the news for a long time on the Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby was a client of my firm for. 30, 40 years. I started representing about 18 years ago or so. And lo and behold, if everyone's aware of the criminal case that just started about a year ago with this woman named Constant, well, I was involved in the civil case. I was actually representing him, and I had represented him for two years since then. I've represented him for the last 15 years since that case, or whatever, 13, 14 years afterwards. Been very few isolated, but I was involved in the Because many times, publicists and everyone ask me to be a spokesman, what is this case about? And I knew some facts, uh, but I don't want to be called as a witness uh, in that criminal case. But basically, I came out right away based on the facts that I knew, based on my communications with her mother. 
I said, this is nothing more than a shakedown. Well, someone said to me, Harvey Levin once to me, isn't every case Yes, because uh, someone is looking for money. But in that case, I said, absolutely, I thought it was a shakedown. Of course, I don't know anything about the background of the client, what has come forward now from things that occurred 30, 40 years ago, or 25, 30 years ago. So what happened? I used those words, and I got sued. So to that effect, they neutralized me. I couldn't represent the client, which is okay. I'm not sad about that, although I never would have let the client take a deposition, which is now the primary reason they're going after him, when there's a pretending criminal case. People know that if you have a criminal case, until that case you know is out, you should protect your client because you should take the Fifth Amendment. But he's the kind of guy I think he said, don't worry, I've got nothing to lose. And that's the basis for this current prosecution. So, you know, I had no idea about his background. I could only deal with him based on my limited deal. I mean, as someone asked me before, you know, when, when I represent a client, sometimes I represent a client once, I won't do another thing for them for five years. We do litigation. We don't do their, some clients I have, like I've had clients I've only represented two years, I may have a hundred matters for them in the last two years or whatever. Not necessarily, but different tabloid stories and things of that sort. But, you know, it's a, an evolving process and, um, you know, in terms of who do you not represent, who you, but I've learned, and sometimes it's difficult to get out, like it was difficult with me in the Cosby case as things developed to figure out a graceful exit at the end of that, you know, after being involved for a year with that matter, and it's, uh, it's, it's difficult, um, you know, to figure out who do you, because everyone knows as a lawyer, you go to law school, everyone deserves to be represented by a lawyer, whether they're a mass murderer, uh, you know, anyone, but, you know, one thing, I never wanted to be a criminal lawyer because of some of my family members were victims of crime, but I respect criminal lawyers. I don't respect the fact that when criminals get off on technicalities, but that's the America, that's the system we have here, which is much better than it is throughout the rest of the world. But it's, uh, you know, it's a difficult task when to determine who you want to turn down, um, and I'm fortunate enough that I can do that, but most lawyers maybe can't. Like. I mean, I think we have an understanding of sort of traditional corporate litigation practice, certainly the civil corporate side. But what is, do you have a typical day, and if not, sort of, what, is your, what do your weeks look like? Well, so first of all, people don't realize that I try a lot of matters. I've had over 100 <coughs> trials and arbitrations, and, you know, so that's just rare because many lawyers have been practicing 20 years have never had a trial unless you're personal injury and criminal lawyers, they have trials, all, but there's a civil litigator to have a lot of trials. And in California, especially entertainment, virtually everything goes to arbitration, but I've had some big trials. In fact, I had the first case on court TV after the OJ case, and as a result of that, for Jean-Claude Van Damme, uh, which I didn't want to be on court TV, but it was, you had to make sure your suits were cleaned. And, I, <laughs> and all I had to remember is with the judge, who looked exactly like Judge Joe Wapner, and I don't know if people are old enough to know who Judge Joe Wapner is from, what was that, uh, before a uh, judge? He just kept on saying, Mr. Singer, um, you're, you're, you're blocking the jury. And then I turned around and said, am I blocking the jury? And they say, no, you're blocking the camera from looking at the judge. <laughs> but, uh, but from that case, interestingly enough, I got one of, my, one of the biggest cases I had, although it was not entertainment, uh, where I, a guy called me up, a general counsel from a big company in New York. He said, you know, we're coming out. We heard you're a good trial lawyer. It was, it was a business case. Somebody, although it may be in the entertainment, somebody signed a contract with Ticketmaster. They had a silent auction of, of, to determine who would have the right to um, basically advertise exclusively for the sale of CDs on Ticketmaster. And I said, look, I can't meet with them in the middle of the trial. You could watch me on court TV. The guy called me the next day and says, you're hot. So, uh, <laughs> And that was a, afterwards an 11 week jury trial, which was the longest trial. We even went away for two weeks on vacation. I'd come back one day while the jury was deliberating. We, my client got sued for $15 million. They said, we owe the money, let's figure out a way to get out of it. And I wound up getting a $5 million fraud case. And as they were determining to go to punitive damages, they settled the case. But um, in terms of you know, the, the type of a daily practice, I would say, because I also do a lot of depositions. I mean, I, I've taken close to a thousand depositions, but this doesn't happen every day, and I've tried to delegate more to other people, and it's very important for young lawyers, and for if you have a firm, because how lawyers grow when they learn to take depositions, and I, have, and I give tremendous responsibility to young lawyers to try cases or try arbitrations. 
But I literally, I hate the emails. I wish I could have got rid of this phone that I gave to my wife it's, or at the office. It's the worst invention as far as I'm concerned because it used to be you could just talk to your clients and so they were limited. But I typically get about 40 to 50 calls a day and I typically get about 200 to 250 emails a day. Substantive. I get a lot of other stuff that my secretary screens out of there. But like, you know, I'm here in New York. I thought today would be an easy day. You know, I'm coming here today. And, uh, but even last night, uh, I had to do a conference call to settle a very high profile case involving some very sensitive issues at 11 o'clock. I was on a two, over two hour conference call to try to settle the case. That's, and uh, hopefully we were negotiating the deal. And, but typically, I mean, I get calls because we were on the West Coast many times early in the morning, getting a lot of phone calls in the morning. Uh, dealing with emails. I rarely go to lunch and uh, in terms of going, I bring lunch in. I guess I swallow lunch instead of eating it slowly. But bottom line is that it's, you know, happen to, and things are happening because of the type of work we do. Like, for example, today I had two new matters where some, I got frantic emails that this publication wants to run this story about this client, another publication wants to run a different story, so now I have to deal with this. And so we're constantly getting new matters, and so, but it's, you have to juggle it. And then at the end of the day, you know, I start going through my emails at the end of the day to try to respond to most of them, and the calls, I try to mix them in, but it's a very busy, hectic day that so I So let me ask have. you about that juggling point, and um, you've been described as the uh, concierge consigliere, uh, and I know that when I was you did, we did go to a nice place to have lunch. We didn't eat a brown bag at your desk. You, you well, me you away. came to, you know, you were hitting me for some money, so of course I can't. <laughs> so we had a nice lunch, and during that I should have had him sit at my desk. Maybe it would have been better. I mean, during that lunch, I think you took four phone calls. It may have been three, but I think it was four. Oh, my gosh. And I'm making rude. these, no, 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 no. And I'm making these names up because they're not exact, but it was people like Tom Cruise, Katy Perry. Then there was and two tabloids, I think. So four phone calls. I was so impressed. And you know, I come from Washington, D.C. We used to know a senator there who would go to a restaurant and have himself paged so he looked important, <laughs> you know. But so in other words, you work hard, you're constantly on call, you're accessible to your clients that need you. How do you juggle? Maybe I should ask Dina, your wife, but how do you pull it off? Because you obviously have a life and other interests. Sir. Well, here's one of the things I do. Uh, I try to play golf. I'm not a great golfer, but I'm one of the few people when I play golf, I play golf Saturday morning and Sunday morning unless I have a trial coming up or an arbitration. But for the most part, I'm really dedicated because it's four hours of downtime with some good friends, uh, some colleagues, and I'm the only one that doesn't bring a cell phone out. So that's the only time they try to reach me. I don't have a phone. But the problem is I am accessible 24-7. And you have to determine, you know, when you've been practicing a long time, what, what has to be done today, what can wait. Like I got some, you know, these emails, I got to speak to you, I just got fired, and I look, you know, it can wait. I mean, yes, he got fired, but it's, it's obviously the most important thing in this person's life. He's not, he works at a, an entertainment company, so I was able to get one of my senior associates to give him a call. And he said, no, can I speak to you later today? I said, no, I'm busy all day today, so I can't deal with it. But for the most part, you have to figure out a way. You can't tell someone how do you do it, how do you juggle. And then sometimes at the end of the day, I say my, to myself, what am I saying? I didn't call that person back. Oh, my God, that's horrible. But, you know, it works to some extent, but it's a question of experience as you, as you practice longer. But it's a constant, I can't schmooze too much, and it's just constantly work. dealing with them. Yeah, but I, listen, I have, I have a great family. I thank God for my wife, who I've been married to over 42 years which is a unique thing when anybody hears that, especially in L.A. It's, the same, it's exactly the same with us, 42. Uh, that's fantastic because sometimes, like yesterday, I was with a guy at the Giant game, and the guy said, how long have you been married? 40? He said, oh, I've had three wives, and we've been married 40 years. <laughs> but um, You know what Marla said about that? Somebody said, how did it happen? How did you put up with him for 42 years? She said, it's simple. We're both madly in love with the same man. <laughs> So, that's a great line. So, in any event, I like that line. Now, in terms of juggling, though, you have great people that you rely on and use. That's like, true. Like Andrew uh, Brettler. Andrew Brettler, uh, I would have to say, and I know, you know, here's an interesting story. Andrew went to a big 
a Wall Street firm like Jay Lavely, uh, Simpson Thatcher. In fact, my partners, Jay Lavely, I don't know why he went to want to be partners with me. He <laughs> went to a Yale undergraduate and uh, Penn Law School. And, uh, underachiever. He was underachiever, that's for sure. And I'll tell a funny anecdote about the Jeremy Piven case in a few minutes, or maybe know the mercury poisoning, dealing with people who looked down at people maybe from Brooklyn Law School. So, uh, but Andrew Brettler came out to L.A. He was, he was very happy at a big Wall Street firm, Simpson Thatcher, and he had just moved out here, and uh, he said, you don't mind if I meet with you? And I've done that many times. People come out, and I talk to them, and say, sure, if, you know, if I have the time, I'll try to make the time. He's like a nice young man. First, we went to Brooklyn Law School, I, and I really thought he was great. I said, why can't we get a guy like this work with us? <laughs> And he was a nice guy and a great guy and really smart. And then slowly, we developed a bromance. No, uh, but uh, <laughs> but basically, uh, he. I one day said to him after you know I met him twice. I said, "Listen, Andrew, I can't afford to pay you. You know what your firm because we've recently hired a couple of lawyers from some big firms as well. We told him, listen, if you want to work at our firm, hopefully you'll enjoy it. But listen, if you become a partner." I believe you'll be making more money than you will if you were at this big firm, because it depends on the, you don't have any business to become a partner of my firm. Just do the work, because ultimately the client, and I, I have a practice where if I get a client on a case, like Kevin Hart, an example. Kevin Hart, I get a matter on a small matter, tabloid matter. Now another matter, and I bring in Andrew. Another matter comes in on Kevin Hart, I'll bring in Andrew. Now the third time, Kevin Hart's represented, they're not gonna call me. And I'm so happy they call Andrew directly. And now that's his client. And that's how I've done it throughout my practice with all the lawyers because I think it's important to have people develop clients. And it's great with me. I've got enough clients, enough jurors. I don't need to deal with everybody. They still call me if something bad is coming up, like the recent extortion issue with Kevin Hart. But, um, but the point is, is that we ultimately developed a great relationship. And Andrew is flourishing, hopefully, at the firm. Uh, he can't wait for me to make my plane tomorrow, we don't get caught in thunderstorms since I invited him as one of my guests to the World Series tomorrow. I haven't oh. seen one in 29 years. Uh, well, we, I haven't been to any World Series, but be that as it may, we were hoping the Yankees would be that we can kick their butts. I grew up in Brooklyn, we hated the Yankees, but, and I, my secretary said to me, you know, your tickets are going for 5,000 a seat. I said, Fine. so when the Yankees lost, they said, you know, they're down to 1,800 now. With you said. <laughs> Timing's everything. So but, uh, our, yeah. st our students are listening very intently. What can you tell them about Andrew that stood out and you know, could guide them in how to succeed in, in the environment that you have? Well, first of all, let me say this applies to any student. And I learned the hard way as well. And I've dealt with all the lawyers that have come to my firm. Uh, and I can tell a little anecdote about the uh, dealing with some firms. Your first job, your law school is very important possibly for your first job in my opinion, and how you do the class. The people who finished at the top of the class is probably going to have a big selection. The people in the middle of the class may be more typical. The people in the bottom of the class, but, you know, it depends unless they have some relationship. You know, you worked as a law clerk and hopefully, and, and get your skills and learn to develop don't get pigeonholed. So my recommendation is, first of all, you're very marketable. Three years, don't after you're working at one firm, seven years if you're unhappy. Uh, and if you develop good skills, ultimately you get a different job in a different field. Like a lot, well, first of all, people come to my firm and say they want to be an entertainment lawyer. I cut off, shut off the interview. I'm not looking for entertainment lawyers. I'm looking for lawyers practice entertainment. And part of the problem is because we have a lot of cases that are not that, you know, I may have a case with Kelsey Grammer or, you know, Scarlett Johansson involving, she's got a big case against a contractor. It's just a construction real estate dispute. Does that mean you're doing entertainment? Well, they like the fact that they're representing someone famous, whatever. But I think what's important is don't get down if you don't get a great job or the job you want the first year. Work hard, just like what I did. I had no expectation to get this first job as a lawyer. Um, I'll just give you an interesting anecdote. I'm out three years as a lawyer, and my firm dissolves. 
And it's very difficult to get a job, especially when you're going from one firm because you say you can't talk to the boss. You're leaving. You don't want anyone to know what you're doing. I was really fortunate in that I had partners that were working with me. The, the firm dissolved, and a lot of partners were doing favors for me. They were calling friends they knew and lawyers, and they said, well, interview Marty. He'll be a great deal. I'd already had a, I tried a case with my partner. I had done other cases, that, and I had a lot more experience. And I don't know anybody here from Manette Phelps, because I don't mind uh, defame. It's not defame, defamatory if it's true, right? Who studied libel law? Privileged conversation. It's privileged to pay. I want to see it. All. I don't group. care. I told it to the head of the part when I played golf with him a few. He says, they really did this? So one of the partners, while I was waiting to make a decision, says, you know what? Why don't you interview at Manette Phelps? I said, wow. It's a big firm at the time. It's now got offices all over the world. It's got more offices than I have lawyers. And, uh, and, I, and I go for the interview, and the fourth guy sees me after I've been there an hour and a half or whatever, says, why are you here? And I look at him, for a job. What do you mean, for a job? Yeah, I'm looking for a job as a lawyer, as an associate. My firm is dissolving. He said, yeah, but you went to Brooklyn Law School. We would never hire you. Now, fast forward 20 years later. <laughs> I get a call from a headhunter. And the headhunter says, this law firm is looking, would like you to be the head of the litigation part. I had no idea who the firm is. I wasn't going to leave. I didn't want to go from a small firm, your own business. I said, well, can you tell me? No, I can't. It's confidential. I said, well, if you don't tell me, how can I consider? So they said, it was Manette Phelps. They want you to head the whole litigation department. I said, no, that's a mistake. I went to Brooklyn Law School. <laughs> Call them up. <laughs> And tell them, you must have the wrong Marty Singer because I'm the one that went to Brooklyn Law School. So she calls me back that day. No, no, they want you. They don't care about Brooklyn. Well, tell them. That would be the last effing firm I would ever work for. So. I love it. I love it. Yeah, was that the Jeremy Piven story? No, the Jeremy name? Piven story is a different story. This is an interesting thing. I love going against lawyers from Harvard. There may be some Harvard graduates here, although... Uh, Not likely. You know? No. All right, I won't defame now. Uh, and I've worked with lawyers firm, and they're really smart, but they don't really learn what we learn here, nuts and bolts. They more and more about the, how law has evolved. And they're really good lawyers, a lot of them. I'm not criticizing them. They're really smart. I mean, that's the first thing you look to. We said, what do you look for? I want someone who's smart, someone who's willing to work hard, not my hours, and someone who's dedicated and cares about the, the work they do. If you have those three attributes, I hate, I'm not answering your question, move to strike, it's non-responsive, but <laughs> getting back to that question before, if you have those three attributes, you're smart, you want to work hard, not kill yourself, and you care about your work. And by the way, when you care about your work, no matter what kind of work you do, you're gonna enjoy it. And you know, some people love doing certain types of business. Why does he enjoy being a construction defects lawyer or a bond lawyer? You know what? He cares about what he does. He wants to make sure that that bond gets through. But seriously, so Jeremy Piven, I don't know if anybody remembers, he had mercury poisoning. Everyone says, what is mercury poisoning? And they were suing him, the producers, to wipe him out. And they had a lawyer from one of the firms you mentioned earlier today. No, we mentioned uh, privately about some of the big firms that hire people. And it was a very intense arbitration, and it was a great arbitration. It went four straight days, and we had this arbitrator. I can't remember his name, but he was like renowned. He was the number one arbitrator. I don't know people are sports fans, but he, at that time, it's called a baseball arbitrator, where they determine what should the salary be for the baseball player. In other words, the team says X, the player says Y, and he makes, and it was renowned, this arbitrator. He'd never worked before this arbitrator before. Very tough case. Uh, they thought they were going to kill him because even though he said mercury poison, there was some video of him playing the drums like, the, like after he said, I can't work anymore at a club. And they had all these tabloid articles out there and, uh, or photos of him doing all these things. And it's good when you represent an actor, by the way, because you can tell him to act. But seriously. <laughs> Excuse but, me. But uh, so... During the case got really heated, which I don't mind, you know, this guy was really not happy like it because he had his clients, a big law firm, he had like four guys there and I'm by myself. 
guy from the union sitting next to me, and I, that's true, don't worry about it, <laughs> sit there like a dummy, but don't talk. But in any event, an older guy, and, you know, I'm going against these four lawyers, and they've got, you know, big screens, and I'm coming out here from California, and I'm just trying to question witnesses. So the, the lawyer from uh, representing the studio says, that's a ridiculous objection. What law school did you go to? I said, that's an interesting question. And me, the arbitrator, is like, it's like, come on, gentlemen. I said, no, that's okay. I went to Brooklyn Law School. He said, well, that explains those ridiculous objections. I said, really? I don't know what law school the arbitrator went to, but he's certainly granting most of them. So, <laughs> and then I said, and may I ask, what law school did you go to? I said, I don't even have to ask. Let me guess. Harvard? He said, how'd you guess? Mm, that explains why your ass is. I said, that explains how this case is going right. <laughs> All right. And we won. I saved my client's life. Now the guy doesn't know I exist. From that, he became a big star in Entourage. Well, that's great. Now, let me ask you a little bit about privacy. But he's a big Cubs fan, and I saw him sitting there at the Dodger Cup series, and I went. Oh, well, he suffered. <laughs> he suffered. He's, he suffered. Yeah, he won last year. Once is enough. <laughs> right. Let him wait another 98 years. Let me ask you a little bit about privacy, which is a big issue, I'm sure, for many of your clients. And California has an anti-paparazzi law. There's been so many developments, uh, Hulk Hogan with Gawker and just on a daily basis and all of it. What big changes and where do you think that the privacy law is going? Well, it's interesting because California is supposed to have the best, one of the best privacy laws. And I'm very familiar with the Hulk Hogan case. I, that's getting the right jurors in the right jurisdiction, which is, I don't know if people are familiar with Tampa, Florida. I've tried cases there. And, uh, you know, when you have a witness who said, but he was asked a question, and the guy that takes the credit used to work for me, but he never asked the question one of the witnesses. But when you have a witness who says, when is it too young to have a sex tape? And I deal, unfortunately, with a lot of sex tape cases, and we've got to keep it shut down or whatever. Um, so I think maybe six or five years old. And at that point, it's fair game. So when a person makes that comment in a Bible Belt jury of six people who work at Walmart, and you know, and plus, I hate to say it, I've tried a lot of cases in different jurisdictions. Like when I was in Orlando, don't even touch it. The first time the judge said we had it, was represented a famous group, the Backstreet Boys. He said, "Can you imagine? We don't even have we, we don't have good enough lawyers here in Orlando. They had to hire a guy from." Brooklyn Law School, not Brooklyn, they had a guy from L.A. They didn't think they had enough lawyers here to represent him. And the guy said, is he like this? He said, yeah, after that I learned my lesson. You can't try a case in a town like that from lawyers from Washington, D.C. and New York. You, the, the lawyers who tried the case for Hulk Hogan were local good plaintiff's lawyers. So there's a lot of stuff you need to know about that. But in terms of getting to privacy, I think that's a, it's a good case that came down for the standpoint that many times you can say, like I've dealt with it uh, this week, with last week, with everything coming out, it's, this is what is truly changing. Because of the Harvey Weinstein matter, a woman will come forward and say, he raped me or he assaulted me. And instead of using your due diligence and not just print anything what anyone says, the media says, you know what? We're going to just run it. If someone says it, we're going to publish it. Now, that's not privacy per se. But it ties into the Hulk Hogan case, which was a sex tape uh, where the guy, Hulk knew he was being videotaped, and it's a shame they didn't take it up on appeal. I don't know what would have happened. But it has acted as a deterrent because a lot of media organizations, like I had lunch with the, uh, the, the editor of one of the biggest tabloid here the other day, and, you know, he said, you know, we're concerned because we're, we don't know if you'll get a runaway jury. So it has an impact, and maybe, but in terms of stopping the story, but in terms of privacy itself, I am finding that at least the cases and the case law and the statutes are moving more towards it's, we're not going to protect your privacy. So it so, comes down to damages, right? Well, there may be damages, but, you know, that's a unique case. Uh, and it depends, on, like if that case was tried in New York with a New York fellow, I don't know what would have happened there. I mean, it's like, you know, you, you, 
you know, it depends. I mean, as a lawyer, you, many times you think of where can we bring this claim? Where can we bring this case? But in terms of the privacy, because I know I deal a lot, and like somebody called me the last week, I just moved here from, you know, England, and you know, we have these great privacy laws, which is true. I, every time I go, I got paparazzi following me, taking pictures of my kids. I don't mind they take pictures of me, but what about my kids? And we don't have the protection in the U.S. like they have in England. And I want to take pictures. Even France is even better. In France, you can't even take a picture of someone doing a private, you know, act. You could be, you know, walking together, strolling on the street. The problem is they don't award big damages. But the law is evolving into, especially that there's been much more protections to the press and to the media. And so, I, you know, since I've been practicing, I think it's gotten narrowed out, although the Hulk Hogan case is good, the Hulk Hogan case is good, the threat. But I have found that, if anything, the courts are less likely to protect privacy. In fact, I see it right now. When we were involved uh, two years ago or so, two and a half years ago, and there was this horrible hack that took place with the, uh, you know, all these celebrity nudes, uh, and God forbid you tell them, if you take a nude picture, expect that it'll be, like, no, how dare you tell me that? You can't say that to anyone. So if you represent any baby, don't ever tell them. If you, want, if you want to see that picture or video on the internet, then don't put it on your phone. But it is so, was so difficult to shut it down. In fact, we threatened to sue Google because they were taking their time, taking down, even though we had DMCA copyright notices. And the courts are not looking to protect you when there are these violations. And there are all these loopholes like, for example, if someone posts a photo or video that's private, but then the person who takes, who's taken it has put it on the internet or put it out there, and then other people are taking it and putting it on their Instagram accounts, Facebook, putting them on blogs, there's no laws. I've been lobbying with the California, she's now the senator, but she was the Attorney General Kamala Harris, and was like, she just wanted to meet Jennifer, um, what's her name, Lawrence. But uh, be well, that let's as stick with that for a minute. Let me ask you this. So throughout the history of mankind, which is a long time, it's been easy to forget and hard to remember. But now with modern technology that you were talking about, once it's out there, it's hard to forget and erase and delete, and it's easy to remember. So you're a lawyer. Somebody comes. You are the lawyer, the man. So one of your celebrity folks comes to you and says, it's out there. It's completely false. It's defamatory. But what do you do about that? Well, here's a very important issue, and I deal with it on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis. Some, the, you may have a story out there that's false and defamatory, and there's a limited amount of people know. But if you're representing someone really famous, and they uh, want to file a lawsuit, first of all, it's huge news. Now everyone knows about it. As opposed to, it was in the news two days ago, people forget. It's a news cycle. That's always everyone said. Let's see what happens after two days and two weeks. There's always another scandal. I remember when I represented Eddie Murphy with the, picked up the transgender, and I came out, he was a good Samaritan. That was my quote. We sued the tabloids, and we shut it down. And he was so concerned this is going to be out there, always out there. But there are things. So you've got to be really careful when you file a yeah. lawsuit and have a strategy. Now do you want the whole world to know? And then this is the bigger issue. With depending on the media organization, the organization you want to go after, is your client willing to go forward with being deposed to get into every private thing? Because the law is basically with defamation is it's not only false, but it hurts your reputation. So do you want your client to be open up, like especially when it comes to a sex case? or a case involving like he cheated on someone, I'll say to someone, one guy called me up one day and said, you know, they said I cheated with Cindy Crawford. I said, well, you should be happy they told you to cheat with you. <laughs> he said, well, did you ever see her face? She looks like a mule. I said, I said, what do you mean talking about it? He says, no, I would never cheat on my wife with her. I said, so you've cheated with you, on your wife with other people. So, but I didn't cheat on, so I said, so you want to sue? Absolutely. I said, so they're going to find out who you cheated on. And by the way, this is what happens when you file a lawsuit. The people will come out of the woodwork and say, oh, that guy did the same thing to me. And that they, so you've got to be very careful. Yeah. And that's why there are so few. I started actually, and now they changed the law in the UK. When I had clients who were defamed, I went to the UK right away, figured out a way we can sue in the UK. Why? No depositions. 
just to answer written questions. And they were devastated about settling because if you lose in the UK, not only do you have to pay damage, you have to pay the other side's attorney's fees. So there's a big downside. So we did that and they changed the law in the UK now when someone can sue. They, in fact, someone told me in Parliament they mentioned my name. Uh, but, uh, so you've got to be very careful and it's, and you know, you've got to think about if someone doesn't, some people don't care about their reputation. They don't care. So what, what else are they going to say about me? Look, Tom Cruise made a big mistake. He's not a client of mine, even though you mentioned it, thank you. But he decided to sue Us, um, excuse me, um, not Us Magazine, uh, not Life and Style. No, no, no. He sued uh, Bauer Communications uh, in touch. And uh, they ran a story about him being a bad father or something like that. And they took his deposition. And by the time the deposition was over, he dropped the case. It wasn't mine. I've been told that. And they wanted to make sure. And, you know, he, he, he did it. Thought he would help himself. So, and believe me, first you got like to, Mission Impossible to take one of those cases. That's Mission Impossible. <laughs> okay. So, but I have to say, I took his examination once in arbitration. I've never seen someone with nicer blue eyes. I was having a bromance <laughs> question. <laughs> In, no, he's not. But I tell you, I, in fact, the woman next to me was the general counsel of the Rice School said, why are we handling this case? I, who hired me? You can't know me such a good-looking, nice guy. <laughs> so you don't, bottom line is you don't want to be like the uh, senator who Roll Call Magazine found rated as the dumbest senator in Congress, and then he held a press conference to deny it. So you want to stay a little bit. <laughs> So, last question before we open it up, and I, I just want to go, go again. You mentioned it to the uh, poorly shaven elephant in the room. So, Harvey Weinstein, uh, just get your reaction as, as a really plugged in person. Is Are these revelations likely to change behavior? Change behavior? Yes. I believe it will. Uh, and I hope it will. It's disgusting. Uh, uh, well, first of all, people are very in fear now, and it may have an adverse effect on women in the workplace in the following respect. It may be tougher to get jobs. Um, I, I can't say it will, but you really have to be careful. You know, I, I many years ago represented Miramax, which was a company that Harvey and I represented for three years ago, and I just knew the guy as a nasty guy, a guy I hated, but whatever, and he, people who worked for him might say, how could you work for a guy like that? And finally, stop. We only sued other studios. But it's going to have an impact, and, and people are scared. I mean, it was interesting. You know, Harvey Weinstein, clearly what he did, you know, people knew that he would hire actresses, girlfriend actors, to work on movies. In fact, I had a case about to go to trial where that was the case. He told the director, this is the girl. She's never acted before. Hire. Otherwise, you're fired. And that's what he did. But I think it will have an impact. And in fact, one of the other issues is there was a guy named Roy Price, and it's a very interesting case. The guy was the president of Amazon Studios. And, um, you know, with the internet, Netflix and Amazon are huge. In fact, you know, I have a client who's doing a $150 million budgeted movie with Netflix, uh, Martin Scorsese. He's shocking. They would pay, well, there's no box office, but they, they make so much money. And there was one claim of sexual harassment, making inappropriate comments to a woman and he lost his job. Uh, and I'm not going to get into what I know about it, it's irrelevant, but the point is is that there is such concern. I mean, I, th there's other people that I've spoken to, and the guy says, hey, I don't care, so let it come out, I guess. When they ask for it, I, they want to get a movie part, it's fine with me. I, I'm not is telling seven you. seven second delay working here? <laughs> but, no, it will have an impact. And I think it's good, and, 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 and one of the biggest problems is because I've been doing this for 30 years. In fact, most of my most important cases and most important clients, including some ex-presidents, uh, politicians, athletes, no one knows about. And that's why people come to me, is to keep it secret, keep it quiet. That's what we're asked to do. Sometimes you've got to pay money or figure out other ways. That's, people don't realize those are some of my biggest clients and one of the biggest things. And now, everyone is panicking that what if that story gets out? What if, because women are feeling, you know, you know, women can say whatever they want, and it could get published. So I'm concerned first making sure that the media doesn't react by not living up to their responsibilities 
as media to making sure that they act responsibly and not act recklessly. Although the laws are horrible in the U.S. for defamation. Anyone who practices defamation law knows the worst law in America is defamation. The hardest claims to win on. It's very difficult uh, because you not have to prove it's false, hurt your reputation. We have to prove the media organization knew or should have known. I absolutely believe, and hopefully it will be better for the industry and for all industries. I represent a lot of people outside the entertainment, some big Fortune 500 CEOs or big executives. And they don't, you know, I sometimes say my business cards is I represent men and some women who behave badly. And, um, but hopefully it'll change. But you know what? Sometimes you can't change someone who's got the stripes and they're not going to change after someone's been doing this for 50 years. But I think it will affect, or 30 years or 10 years, I think it's going to change things. And I, someone told me at a big company right now, he said, we have a new policy. There will be no meetings between an executive and a female alone. We don't care what that role is, it's going to have to be a third person present at that meeting. And I welcome that. I think it's a good idea because most cases are he said, she said. It started in law school, I remember, in my tort class. Um, and so what, who went through the red light? Plaintiff says you went through the red light. Plaintiff says defendant went through the light. And defendant says, no, no, the light was green. So it's always, who do you believe? Who, how do you win a case? Who, who do you believe? It's credibility. And the same thing with these type of cases. And it's interesting that in California, we had a case against a big law firm where someone got over $10 million on a sexual harassment case from a lawyer to a secretary. He never touched her once. On the other hand, if there's sexual, you know, if there's oral sex, you're never going to get, or they don't get those type of awards. But some people don't, don't learn. But hopefully, I think now corporate America or small companies recognize you're exposed to big liability, and it could really hurt your business and hurt who you do, you know, who you do business with. How are you going to survive? So it, I think it will have a big yeah. change in how. Uh, although I, I asked my brother in Florida and sister in Florida, do you know anything about the Harvey Weinstein? No, we don't even hear about it. Well, so the hear it in Florida, that's what well, that's true. <laughs> They're younger than me. No, but seriously, we're here on the East Coast. I'm on the West Coast. What? When you look, when you what are they? What are the Republican states? The the blue, the, the what are they color? Red, red, red state. Do the red states care about Harvey Weinstein? No. Well, you think they do? I don't know. If we go to Iowa and find out, does anyone really care about Harvey Weinstein? Here's Donald story. Trump. Do you don't even care Donald Trump sexually assaulted everyone? He, his popularity went up. Is uh, Professor Jody Balsam, and she's here with us. I told Jody, <laughs> when I went to law school, they never had such young professors. Yeah, well. It's she, true. She is extremely. Maybe because I was young. Everyone seemed like they were 90 years old. She's one of a kind. And uh, the first question is going to come to you from the Bessels. Uh, Vice President Nicole Gudelman, class of 2018, and then we'll open it up others and wait for the microphone since we are recording this. So, Nicole, where's Nicole? Right here. Oh, there you are. Hi, Nicole. <laughs> Happened upon. Well, it's, a, it's an excellent question, and, uh, and I do believe that's correct in terms of sometimes, especially if you have a, a trace that goes to trial, and all of a sudden you see things that you never saw before. But I have an adage, and, I, and the client needs to trust you because it's got to be, a, if it's a brand new client, they many times don't say, and by the way, I deal with the editors of publications and the general counsel publications on a weekly, daily basis. 
And I'll be up front with them. I'll say, this is a new client. And I've told the clients, you got to tell me the truth. You tell me the truth, and then I'll figure a way how to deal with it. And so, but many times they don't like, I had, and, I, and this is what I tell clients if it's a media issue. I said, here's the problem. If you don't tell me the truth, or you lie to me, it's going to be a problem for me and for you forever. You want to kill this story. You want to prevent this story from coming out. And I tell you, they're going to prove that it's a lie. So I'll have to figure out a different way to kill the story with whatever, how I approach the media. And sure enough, they don't, they don't trust me, they don't know me, and they're not going to tell me they did something horrible for the most part, and most of the time they don't when I deal with a client for the first time. And I, but, but once I start lying on behalf of this client, I have no credibility for my hundreds of other clients when I start dealing with the media. So I'll be up front when I talk to the media and tell them you've got to be truthful for me. And you're right, many times the clients won't. But if someone has worked with me and they know me, uh, or if they haven't and they're facing some serious, serious consequences, hopefully because I have a deep voice, no, hopefully they will recognize they come to me for a reason, they're paying me $1,050 an hour, whatever, that you've got to give me the facts. But you're absolutely correct. A lot of times the clients won't do it. Now, sometimes the clients will. I'll give you a little anecdote. I don't know if people know who Michael J. Fox was, but Michael J. Fox was, is, he was a big actor on TV, and I became aware that he had Parkinson's. And he said, we can't get it out there. We're negotiating a, a, a certain deal, and it's called a, a syndication deal for the reruns. And I knew the facts. And I had to figure out a way to kill the story back then. And I knew I couldn't lie. Because if I lied, and, and I knew it was going to come out, it was going to affect him in the future. When he tried to kill a different story, it would affect me on my other clients. So. What I did, it depended on the media organization I dealt with, and for about almost two years I kept it out of the media, and I said, here's what's going on. Uh, and that, there was a difference in terms of s stealing medical records, although now we have HIPAA, I don't think we had HIPAA at that time to protect medical records, but I would tell the media, listen, you better make sure you have this. First of all, I said, Michael, because we've sued before for him, he's not going to get involved in his personal issues. It's none of your business, his medical condition. But you better have it correct, because if it's not, and you say he has this medical condition and he loses the syndication deal or the company loses it, you're going to be exposed to 50 to 100 million dollars. So as long as you're willing to take that risk. And I say the only way you know it's true is if you have the medical records. And at that time, in, I think it was in Massachusetts, it was a crime. So go ahead, because I guarantee you, if we find out you have medical records, we're going to go after you. And we kept it quiet. And now all of a sudden, Michael J. Fox comes. I wasn't told, I'm not given the thing. He decides to do an interview with People magazine two years later. I got called from 20 people. I to me, how, well, what when this? I said, well, that wasn't me. That was a partner of mine, unfortunately, was filling in for me because I was on a trial. And he said, okay. And so I got the trust, and I was able to deal with whatever I had to need to deal with. But you're right. People won't tell you things until the very end when you see, oh my God, especially with emails now. I mean, emails are the greatest thing for cases because people do not write, when I you know, start private, people only had letters. People deal with emails like you're talking to someone at the bar, a, you know, a very casual conversation. You'll say things you have no idea what you're saying. And texting is even worse. Now texting is becoming the biggest issue. People text all the time, we're not knowing that someone is ever going to see that text, although my experience has been that the men always delete the text and the women save them for 10 years. But, <laughs> but you'll never know when you will see something in writing, and you've got to be really careful. But it's a great question, and it's true that many times the clients, but you have to develop a trust, and they have to trust you, and it takes a while for clients to trust lawyers. And hopefully, you know, I've developed that, but not the first time I deal with a client. Great first question. What else, who else we got? Yep. Yes, sir. Mediocre question, I can tell. No, I'm joking. Uh, hi. Thank you, Mr. Singer, for coming you to You call me Marty, tonight. but that's fine. Thank you, Marty. Uh, it means a lot to all of us to have you here. Um, my name is Joe LaRussa. I just graduated back in May from Brooklyn Law School, actually. 
and I, uh, I'm looking for a job myself, and you told us about your experience finding uh, your first job out in California, how you just saw the ad in the paper and you just wrote in and, and applied. And now that you have your, your own firm, uh, my question is, do you have any advice, or what advice can you give to someone recently graduated in getting that first job if they want to get, whether it's in entertainment or, or, or any particular field, how do you go about it in the modern era of, of online applications and, and things of that sort? And where are you barred exactly? Because you work- What was the last thing you said? Where are you barred? Where are you admitted to the bar? Because you were California and- No, 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 I just took the California bar and I knew if, if you ever want to move out of state, it's a big mistake, because I knew I wanted to live out of state. Had I taken the New York bar in July, or whatever, of that year, 77, I would have got the result. The, then I couldn't take the California bar until next February, and I wouldn't have gotten the results until a year later. So I think it's important, if you want to try to pick another location, to, uh, you know, to, to take the bar first in that other location, right. unless you really want to go by coastal, whatever, or take a different field. But I recommend that if you're thinking of moving, uh, Take the bar first in that state if you really want to start practicing there. Uh, but to answer the, uh, have you finished your question? I'm, I don't know. Or yeah, that, that multiple, was, that these was are multiple choices just, like uh, sorry, yeah, that, that multi-state exam, it. right? <laughs> just well, you can get it right or wrong. No one knows. You guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, they don't do multi-state in New York. Am I correct? No, they do sure now. Uniform bar. Oh, you did. I remember, yeah, my they, God, yeah, that was the worst. It. Yeah. It was two answers. I don't understand. But that, that was the gist of the question. Just what, what kind of advice can you give to, to someone in, in the modern era, or if they wanted to apply to your firm or something like your firm? Well, look, we rarely hire someone straight out of law school, and uh, it, it becomes problematic. Although, what I did, just as an example, uh, my wife volunteers. If someone says, what do you do? She works as, she's charitable, and she has great charities at the Rape Treatment Center. And in California, it, they deal with kids that are raped between the age or assaulted between the age of two and 17. So a woman she works for, whose husband is a lawyer, they, have a, they won't allow this person to get hired at his firm. He's got a big real estate firm. So I said, all right, let him work for me as a law clerk. And he's worked for me as a, I mean, he's a he graduated law school. He's working for me as a law clerk, which is I'm telling him, you know, we're not dealing as a lawyer. And we're likely now, after doing a good job and working with him for a year, he's likely to get hired as an, as an associate at the firm. Um, it's been very difficult for him. Uh, he had to work in L.A. I mean, it's terrible. I, I didn't think you could work for free. I thought there are laws that say you can't, but like I will never. So, someone says, can I work for you voluntarily for free? No, you can't. You've you got to pay someone minimum wage. There's no, unless you go to school, you can get a credit. So you might... If you, there's a field that you want, see if you can even get a job at a law firm. Volunteer if you can see, pay, maybe I can work as a law clerk. Recognizing, I'm not going to get paid as a lawyer, let me see what I can do. And you never know, because that's what happened with me. I mean, <laughs> they didn't want to hire me as a lawyer. And, and by the way, once I passed the bar, I saw it was a lot easier. I got some jobs until I finally got a job. I thought, this firm looks right. I got a job with a criminal lawyer, construction defect firm, all these different jobs, and it opened up, and it takes a while. But Obviously, I don't think it's anything wrong to get a job in a field that you don't like, as long as you get a job. And the reason being is you're much more marketable than you see when you look at a resume and they graduate in June of 1976, they took the bar, they passed the bar December 1976, and now it's November 77, they still haven't worked for anyone. And, you know, it's hard to say because it's different in the, the New York area, but I think any job you can get as long as you can work as a lawyer. And, you know, sometimes picking a field in the corporate field, you should look at a, I don't, I think this is a good idea. People don't realize it. Comparative schools, you might want to go to, you know, Fordham, look at their board for jobs that are open. Just because it's informed doesn't mean they're not going to have a job available for a Brooklyn Law School student. Go to the other law schools, and I've advised people, and you can see what happens. But your first job is going to be very tough many times, you know, unless you're a law review, the top of the class, or you have some contact, you're Marty Singer's nephew, whatever. <laughs> uh, but unless my kids say, no, I don't like that kid, don't hire him. But seriously, um, I think you have to try to be creative if you can't find it on your own. And, and it doesn't matter. Some of the best lawyers who work for me and work with me or against me, they're not top of the class. 
and they've worked hard, and you can move something. Now, there are some fields that's difficult to move from. For example, you know, if you, want to, if you get to become a criminal lawyer, it may be easy to work, get a job in a criminal lawyer, like to work for the DA's office, I don't know, or whatever. Figure out what next case Cy Vance has decided not to prosecute. No. <laughs> Low, you heard out there, huh? Uh, no, I know. I've got clients who have been in situation with that. But um, seriously, then it's going to be hard for me to go from there to becoming a civil lawyer. And you never know. Like, for example, I really want to be a tax lawyer. I thought it would be so easy. The last thing I thought of being a litigator um, or sometimes being a trans. So what I would, it, it's very tough and I sympathize. And if, and look, I'm always, if someone's in California, if I can give them some guidance, I will. But you're not everyone's going to come to guidance because then I'll be busy every night for the next uh, four months. But I really think you've got to think creatively. If you can't find a job on your own, I, I assume there's still the New York Daily Journal that I think, and then they have P.O. Bob, maybe they don't do that anymore. Uh, I know they still have it in California, the, the California the L.A. Daily Journal. But go to other law schools. See if there are other jobs there. Um, and, you know, maybe even join organizations where you may make relationships with someone and maybe you never know you meet someone. Like someone told me the other day, I said, how would you get that job? He said, you know what, I went to this organization, I started hanging out with some people, and lo and behold, the guy told me, you're a really nice guy, uh, what do you do? And he says, I'm a lawyer, I'm not happy with my work. He hired him, he's got a great job now, he's been practicing for 15 years. So, you know, listen, it's a very tough field, it's, you know, people pay a fortune to get to law school, uh, and then they decide when they graduate, you know, and there's a lot of what I call underemployed lawyers. Um, but I really believe you do a good job you, you, and, and work on your writing. It's very important for young lawyers, in my opinion, to work on their writing. Feel, don't hesitate if you have a job to take constructive criticism. Because as a young lawyer, it's really important to be a good writer. Your verbal skills will come and they'll develop but you should try to develop your written skills. And it was interesting, when I first moved out to California and they finally hired me, what's was the first thing they told me to do? You need to go to speech class. I said, what? You gotta get rid of that Brooklyn accent. <laughs> so they sent me to Cal State Northridge for I don't know how many sessions, and I literally had to spend a you know, long commute, and I, but it was fine, and you know, I, I learned not to say chocolate and coffee unless I talk fast. Toity Toy Street. Uh, and, but you know, it's, it's a very, and I think you should look presentable. I mean, like I, it's very important. I mean, yes, a lot of law firms now have casual, but I think you should look presentable and, but hopefully for everyone here, you'll get the right job you want. And if you, and just think of this, it may not be your dream job, but make the best of it and you will enjoy it and you will succeed in your career. So maybe. And thanks, I mean, the jobs, it's, a, it's so important. So thanks for spending time and giving that good thorough advice. Maybe time for one more question or we can break up and the bar is still open here. One more, I knew that, oh, one more? Boy, um, so few it, questions. Okay, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, did I ever sue you or did you sue one of my clients? <laughs> You just showed up for free cocktails? <laughs> Not really. Uh, no, it's okay because it's okay. Yeah, I, I answer Why questions from people who are not lawyers. Ask my wife <laughs> or my kids. Okay, because you just said. Uh, Do you want to use the mic so everyone can hear? Or is the mic not working? Do you really need the mic? I mean, can you I can hear you perfectly. But I heard a couple of people in the back going like, okay, go ahead, speak up. Um, and, and again, this is coming from a completely uh, layperson point of view. Hello, yeah, it, it, um, yeah, like I love my voice. Uh, you just mentioned one example of the woman that wasn't even touched and got those $10 million. You want to work for that lawyer? He's out of business. <laughs> no. Uh, to me, as a lay person, and just so you see, because uh, how different things look for the person that's not a lawyer. When I think about something like uh, a window washer having a fatal accident and not being able uh, to work as a wind, like anyone wants to, as a window washer ever again, 
if you get $350,000 for the rest of your life, you're lucky. How do you as an individual reconcile the 10 million with the 350? You know, it's a great question because unfortunately in California, we have medical malpractice limits. Uh, and I don't have that, I don't know if they have it in New York, but you literally can go, there's a case where a guy had a bad leg, needed to be amputated, they amputated his right leg. That was a mistake, we should have amputated his left leg, and then amputate both legs. And the law says you get 250,000 maximum damages and loss of income, and that's it. So how do you reconcile? I'm against it. I, 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 first of all, I, I think it's horrific. I mean, I think that if someone loses their livelihood and they get seriously injured, they should get compensated. Uh, a lot of times what happens, here's part of the problem because I see it in California. A lot of times you go to the lawyer, and you go to a lawyer, and I don't want to say it's negative, but it's called a personal injury mill, and I don't mean that negatively, but people are just interested in selling. I, I see lawyers who make a fortune, a lot more money than me, nobody knows about them, and they work nine to five, and they take eight week vacation, and they're not interested in getting a lot of money for the person who, they're more interested in, let's turn it over, and let's get hundreds of cases, and you know we'll make our fee here, we'll make our fee here. So you gotta make sure you go to the right lawyer because most lawyers, a lot of lawyers are not gonna be interested in looking out for the best interest of the client. I, I, I'm not trying to think, I look out and I care for my clients. I've said before that my clients, you're effing with me. And I don't mean French toast. So, but I care for my clients. And I won't say that's a rarity, but it's not most lawyers think that way. So I do agree, it's not right and hopefully you find the right lawyer, and, you know, but the law doesn't protect them. Someone who makes 50,000 a year as a window washer, 30,000 a year as a window washer, they've got 15 years left to work, maybe they get four hundred fifty thousand dollars and some pain and suffering, and someone looked at some porn on a video, on a computer, and a guy said, I like the way you look in that dress, he gets $10 million. So, well, so it's wrong, I agree with you. You just heard, you just heard the magic words, I care, for my clients, and that is a fitting, concluding uh, coda for our guest. Marty, I cannot tell you not only what a captivating night this was, <laughs> and we've got some special bling here. This is actually Brooklyn Law School via Tiffany's bling, so here you go. How do you like that? Thank you very much.